Hello and welcome to the channel. If you are new here and you enjoy listening to horror stories, this is the channel for you. Click subscribe before we get started and drop a like on today's video to show your support. I am your channel host. Without further ado, let's begin. Most of my adulthood was spent alone. Even though it was lonely, I enjoyed the majority of it. It allowed me to develop some independence and control, and when I wasn't busy or occupied, I often found that I liked the peace and quiet. The solitude was calming, and when you're alone, there is no one to judge you. You can be yourself, and no one will judge or comment on your every move. So while the years were a lonely stretch in most parts of my life, the loneliness didn't bother me too much. I wasn't lonely when I was alone, nor did I feel alone when I was with others. When someone was around I could pretend things were normal, and I would enjoy the company. Sometimes, I liked being with people, but only the right people. Maybe some of you are reading this thinking I'm absolutely nuts and need to get my head checked. Or maybe some of you can, well, relate. I spent a lot of time at work. I got promoted to the head of my branch. The job became less tasking once I got promoted, which is kind of funny. It gave me a lot of free time than I had originally. That meant that the time I spent not working and playing with people was all I had left in the day. When I say playing with people, I mean just always listening to Karens moan on and on, trying to complain about things at my job. I always preferred playing in the yard or watching TV in my spare time, rather than doing anything productive. If I was going out for lunch with my co-workers, I might as well just be relaxing from working. So it was no surprise to me, when I found myself at a party in the middle of the week night, surrounded by a bunch of drunk people from work. I felt awkward and alone, because I hadn't been to a party since I graduated high school. But this wasn't exactly what I expected to happen. As much as my co-workers annoyed me sometimes, there was something about them that just put me in a good mood all day. They were playful, and acted like they just didn't give a crap about anyone judging them. Me on the other hand, I was obsessed with that. It's like I had anxiety off the charts. It was because they were just kind, generous people, and always trying to make their best, to make sure that no one felt out of place or unhappy. They were all working class people, their parents didn't inherit sums, and neither did they. I find them to be the happiest types, unlike the middle class or upper class Karens that come in to complain at my job. I stared at everyone at the party, and that was when I realised just how lonely I was. I found myself stood in the corner of the room holding a drink. Everyone was dancing, there wasn't a single person doing what I was doing stood alone. I practically pushed a lot of people away, but then I didn't want to be distracted by anything or anyone. I focused a lot on myself, and tried to keep a smaller circle of friends during the party. I sat on the sofa in the living room. It was a housewarming party for one of my colleagues at work. He got a new condo and hosted everyone at his place. I wanted to turn him down, but I couldn't. Since I was the manager, that would have looked dumb as hell. And plus I turned down every other invitation that they ever sent me. That also includes Christmas parties. I think I'd run out of excuses to make. So I tagged along with everyone. The party was like any other party, but like I said, I felt out of place. After I spent an hour talking to myself, I decided to call it a night and head back home. I told Carlos I was heading back early. He was confused but sad at the same time. We were pretty close at work, but there wasn't much to the both of us. I helped him whenever he needed my help, and he did the same for me. That was just how our relationship was. 
Carlos walked me to my car and bid me good night. That night I had to reach out to my best friend Jane. Jane and I have been friends since high school, and other than my family, she has been the only one who I can talk to. This is if you don't count those at my workplace, but I never really got into my personal life with them, even Carlos. Jane drove over to my house, we laughed and talked the entire night and did a mini catch-up session with a glass of wine. When it got pretty late, we were about to head to bed. I told her that I was ready to start dating again. It's been years since my last relationship. Maybe this time I was going to deal with things differently. Jane's face was filled with shock as those words left my mouth. No one had said a word about my relationship since my last breakup. Jane hugged me. I guess she was more than happy about it than I was. I knew she was worried about me getting hurt like before. My last relationship ended really badly, but I thought everything was okay now. She was right. We've both moved past our breakups. We were mature enough to now make decisions for our own lives without any fear of getting hurt. I think she understood what it meant to me. I knew she was the type that wanted everyone to be happy, and I knew she would support me in whatever I wanted to do. I kissed her goodbye and we finished off for that night. She headed off to hers ready for bed, and I went to bed shortly after, after popping on my PJs and doing my teeth. I fell asleep without any nightmares that night, but the morning was different. My mind had completely shut itself off. There was nothing I could do except wait until the dream came back again. I thought at first it was the wine, but it didn't feel right at all. I slept through my alarm, so I called in sick. It was one of those sleeps where you feel like you haven't slept. I felt the exact same tiredness when I woke up as I had being drunk going to bed at 1am. Later that day, on my day off from work, I got on Tinder. I redownloaded the app and gave it a go. I was nervous. I had never met someone online and had no idea how this whole thing worked. Especially considering the number of times I'd tried to meet someone. But they'd all been through mutual friends or work and places I'd worked at previously. It took a while before I was able to find a person attractive. Most of the men I was swiping through were easily left swipes. I don't want to be nasty, but I have a specific type. I found an attractive guy named Maxwell. Maxwell looked tall, handsome, and his bio was full of interesting things, unlike most of the guys who put cheesy one-liners thinking that's impressive. The moment he asked to make plans for our first date, I began to get excited thinking this was a fresh start in my life and that I should just give Maxwell a chance, at least one. We kept seeing each other for two weeks and that was when I knew that he was different from the other guys I dated. He wasn't just looking for the old, you know, to get laid, which was something I appreciated, but I could never be too careful. Maxwell asked me to meet for a coffee after our date one evening. I'd let my guard down and was almost certain this was going to be my future boyfriend. I don't know why he wanted to spend time with me after our coffee, but once we got done, he seemed nice and in a good mood. I got to his house after work. I was a bit tired I guess, the coffee was going to help. We talked while I watched him grind the coffee beans. Yep, more coffee. Coffee at the coffee shop? and now coffee at his house. I noticed something odd as he stood there grinding the beans. There was something on the counter close to the coffee machine. There was an open tablet close by, but I acted like I saw nothing and we kept on talking and laughing. When I say open tablet, I mean just like a pill, like a painkiller or some type of medication that was just laying on the counter. Maxwell asked me if I was going to stay the night. I said no as I had work the next day. 
I noticed the frown on his face, but it went as quickly as it came. After a while, Maxwell handed me a cup of coffee. I took a sip of it, and I noticed it had an odd taste to it. I placed my cup back on the counter, and after a while, I pretended to keep drinking, before saying that I needed to leave. I don't know why, but I'd never tasted a coffee anything like this in my life. It had a pungent, nasty taste, kind of like an aftery, sugary, but also sour taste. I couldn't put my finger on it, but it definitely didn't taste like a normal coffee. Maxwell glared at me, one glare I'd never seen him give me before. I guess he was pissed I was leaving. His eyes held anger as he stared at my cup, then back at me. I got up and made my way to the front door, but Maxwell pulled me back and held my arm. Where are you going in such a hurry? He said through his grisses teeth. I smiled at him nervously, trying to free myself from his grip. Home? I replied simply. No, you're not. All these while I've been waiting for you? Sarah, what kind of a man do you think I am? Max, let go of me now. No, you can't go. I tried to push him off me, but he wouldn't let go. What do you mean I can't? Maxwell, let go, I yelled. He squeezed my forearm tighter and pressed himself against me. He pinned me between him and the counter. Let go, I don't need your pity. You don't? His tone was mocking, and I could tell he didn't believe me for a second, which angered me even more. How dare you? This isn't some sort of joke you play on someone. What's wrong with you? Just because I'm single and available doesn't give you the right to touch me like that, I shouted. I kicked him in the nuts, and I watched him spiral to the floor. I ran to the front door, but I felt his grip on my leg as he pulled me to the floor. I slammed face first to the ground, breaking my nose. I was bleeding profusely. I got up to hold my face and cried as he ran towards me. I didn't have the strength to push him away. I let Maxwell pull me inside the apartment and take me into another room. It was dark, I didn't see anything. He pushed me against the wall, and I struggled to get my breath back. Then, Maxwell's hand gripped the sides of my neck tightly, and started squeezing. His thumb pressed hard into my windpipe, and the pressure became worse. I started coughing violently, and at this point, whatever I'd taken sips of in the coffee was starting to kick in, even over my adrenaline. I couldn't breathe anymore, I was starting to get sleepy, and my vision was becoming blurry and hazed. The pressure was too much for me. I slowly lost consciousness, and I heard loud voices coming from outside. Then I heard yelling, screams, and the darkness engulfed me. I opened my eyes to see a few police officers surrounding Maxwell. My eyes barely stayed open for a few seconds. I fought with all my power of will, but they wouldn't. The tiredness overcame me a second time, and all I saw was blackness. When I woke up the second time, I was in hospital. I had drips running through my veins into my arms. There were nurses stood over me with clipboards, and I was scared for my life. He had tried to sedate me. By fighting back, the neighbors next door had heard the banging. They called the cops, and the cops arrived just in time. After all this, I deleted and uninstalled Tinder immediately. 99% of people that people meet on Tinder are good, kind, and not crazy sociopaths. But this guy was a sociopath, a psychopath, a maniac, and the R word, which I don't even want to type. He sickens me.
So I figured this is gonna sound kind of weird. Most Tinder date horror stories come from girls. But I'm a dude. I downloaded Tinder when I was 17. And at the time, yes, I lied about my age. I was curious and had never had a girlfriend. I wasn't particularly bad looking. I'd probably rate myself a 6 or 7 out of 10. Obviously you guys can't see, but I'll just quickly describe myself. I'm 6 foot 4, and I'm around 80kg. I went to gym so I was in shape, but facially I wasn't the best, so that's why I'd say I'm a bit lower. I have pretty bushy eyebrows, quite a chiseled jawline, but my eyes are pretty bad. I have to wear glasses, and I have this condition with my eyes that makes them look really big. Yeah. Thanks God. You maxed out my stats on everything, and then gave me minor stats on one thing. Well, I'll stop complaining, and I'll begin with this crazy story of how I met this girl called Lisa on Tinder. Now being a guy on Tinder is pretty tough, even if you are 6 foot 4 and have a chiseled body. Most guys who do well on Tinder usually buy the premium version, or they're flexing rented cars in the first picture. The ones that aren't rented, well, what are you even doing on Tinder bro if you're a millionaire? In this case, I came to realise this because I did a little experiment. I became a girl on Tinder, just like a catfish and pretended to see how the reactions would be. Sure enough, being a guy on Tinder sucks. I used to get at most maybe one or two likes per week. And as a girl, I got one or two likes within the first 10 minutes of setting up my profile. That's how crazy it was. After this, I just got depressed. I'd use Tinder maybe once a week at this point, as I realised there was no point. All the girls that I match with, I didn't really find attractive. I'm not going to say why, because I'd probably get, well, in trouble. But I think most of you can tell why. There's the obvious reasons. Obviously their faces weren't my type and other things. But I never even started to chat with them. A couple of them sent me messages saying hey, but I just never replied. One time, I managed to match with a girl that I actually found relatively attractive. I thought I'd hit the jackpot, but she wasn't exactly a model. I'd say she was in my league. Like a 6 or 7 out of 10. She was 5 foot 1, so pretty short. She lived around 2 hours from me, which was kind of far, but I did drive. And on top of this, we had some similar interests, including Jim. She had a pretty decent body, and some of her photos were her working out. I liked it, and I decided to spark up conversation with her on Tinder. I just sent a simple hey with a smiling emoji. Probably the dumbest, most NPC way to start a conversation, but hey ho, it shows my experience. When I was nearly 18, it was when I finally decided to meet Lisa. You see at the time, I got her snap and also her whatsapp, but I was a bit of a pussy. We did video calls most nights, but I never got round to actually organising a meet. It was a combination of her living two hours away, plus me being nervous and having never really met a girl in my entire life. When I say met, I don't mean actually seen a girl. I'm not a monk living in a monastery. I mean as in a girl that I'm going to date, or for romantic purposes. Eventually, we came up with the idea of meeting. It was so difficult thinking of what to do, because I just had no idea. Lisa was the type of girl that was quite submissive. I liked that and she would just listen to what I had to say, but also give her opinions. She said she liked it when guys took charge, so I guess the last thing she wanted to do was plan our first date. Over Tinder, she seemed like a sweet girl. She was 5 foot 1, and I was ready to meet her. I stopped putting it off and started biting my tongue. Man up bro, let's do this, I kept telling myself. After around a week, I came up with the idea of meeting her halfway between my county and hers. This was something we were going to do, and then once we met, she could get in my car and we could drive to a diner, bowling alley, maybe even a skating rink. I don't know, 
They were the three ideas we came up with, so at least we had something to do. I arranged to meet her on a weekend. She was getting the train down and then the bus for the second part of the journey, and I was taking my car. Halfway to hers was around 55 minutes in the car, so it wasn't too bad, but considering I had to be back that same day, it was kind of tough. We arranged to meet at a Walmart parking lot, almost a mile away from where her bus was dropping her off. She's a fit gym girl, walking a mile shouldn't be an issue for her, and she literally said that. I did offer to come pick her up by where the bus stop was, but it was super awkward because it was on the edge of a highway, meaning that I have to illegally park up and pretend that I had some type of accident. I don't know what the traffic cops are like out here, but I didn't want to test them. At this point, I was a new driver, so the last thing I wanted was citations. My parents would lose their shit considering they bought me this car. Eventually, I got to the parking lot and just sat there. I reclined my seat back a bit and started to stretch my legs out. Being six foot four in a car journey, especially a long one, starts to ache your legs. She was a few minutes late, but I kind of expected that as the buses weren't exactly always on time. Public transport is known for being quite difficult. My legs were starting to kill, so I decided to get out of the car and just stretch my legs a bit. I was shaking them around, trying to move around the car. At this point Lisa was around 20 minutes late, but I didn't really give a shit because I was more worried about her than anything. As I'm walking around my car, just stretching my legs, doing some weird movements, I notice a girl walking towards the car from the corner of my eye. Now as I look over, I think to myself, that's definitely not Lisa. Lisa has brunette hair, this girl has like bronze, bronzy, light blonde hair. That's the only way I could describe it, but she kept walking towards me. On top of this, she didn't look 5 foot 1. This girl looked fairly tall, maybe around 5 foot 8 or 9. Well, I tried to ignore the girl, thinking maybe she was walking to the Walmart that I was parked up at. But, every glance I took, I realized that this girl was walking directly towards me. Yes, it was Lisa. She had lied about her hair color, her weight, and her height. Now she seems so sweet. I shook her hand and gave her a hug, and she still had such a beautiful smile. Her eyes were glistening just like in the profile, except she was another 7 inches taller. On top of this, she had a lot more weight on her than I thought she had. I got chatting to her and it turns out she quit the gym a few months back. The photos she posted were actually old, and she also dyed her hair blonde, which I didn't like. But I'd just driven almost an hour, made my legs ache like hell, so I wasn't about to turn around and bail on her. I'm not that nasty. We both got in the car and I was ready to give her a chance. Hey, if this works out, we can always just both get in the gym together and maybe I can help her lose some weight and get that badass physique back that she once had. I thought of it like that. I wasn't a nasty guy and my father taught me to respect women. We decided to go grab some food first. We ended up settling on the idea of five guys. During the time Lisa sat in my car, she barely said nothing. Like, barely. All the time I was just awkwardly staring at the road ahead, trying to think of what to say. We arrived at Five Guys and I parked up. I locked my car and walked in with her. I was trying my hardest to create small talk, but it wasn't really going anywhere. Once we got into Five Guys we sat down and took a look at the menu. To my horror, Lisa ended up ordering nine things. Yeah. That's bad. I watched this girl, who number one looked nothing like her profile, down nine meals. I think five of them were burgers, the other one were chicken meals or wings. She was eating like an absolute pig. She had sauce all over her face and was quite literally snorting during the food. At this point, I was so put off. I got myself a burger and a side of fries and some soda. That was it, like a normal person. This girl had some serious issues and I thought she was submissive and self-conscious. This was like the man v food challenge from the TV networks. 
At this point, I was ready to end the date. All we had left was either bowling or some kind of activity. I finished eating and tried my hardest to just not look at her. She was eating like she had mental issues. She was stuffing her face, and on top of this, all the sauce and meat juices were all over her cheeks. Like, worse than an eight-year-old eating their favorite food or birthday cake. I'm not even joking. I wish I'd taken a photo. Eventually, I came up with the idea of going to bowling. We left our table full of all the empty wrappers and boxes, most of which from her food. We got in the car and she still had half the sauce all over her face. People were awkwardly staring at both of us, thinking what the hell, is she trying to make people laugh or something? She wasn't. When we got back in the car, I handed her some of my tissues and told her that she had sauce all over her face. She started looking at me angrily and screaming, saying why didn't you tell me? Now I look like such a dumb bitch. You're an idiot. She had just literally cussed me out and we'd only been together 20 minutes. On top of this she'd eaten like a pig, and to top it all off, she looked nothing like her profile. Could this go any worse? Well, you're about to find out that it did. I started up the car and headed off following the directions on my phone to the nearest bowling alley. When we arrived the place was packed. It was full of families and kids and I was almost certain we wouldn't get an aisle, or lane, or alley, whatever you call it. I don't like bowling. Eventually, it turned out we had to wait an hour, so we played about in the arcade attached to the bowling place for an hour until our lane became available. Lisa was absolutely awful at all the games, but it wasn't a big deal. I didn't figure I'd hold that against her, considering that was the least of my concerns. She went a bit quiet again after this, and during the arcade she didn't really say anything, even while we were playing the games or racing on the car machines. I didn't really know what to say, and the whole date had just turned awkward as hell. She still had slight bits of sauce, but most of the napkins and tissues I'd given her had worked. I wasn't about to be her dad and wipe all the sauce off her face for her, but I felt like people were looking at me as if I was. She was so immature, and I was certain she had something wrong mentally. Not that I'm against that, but she should put that in her bio. Eventually, our number got called out. We go down to do bowling and put our shoes on. They give you these special wooden slash leather bowling shoes. Apparently it's better for the flooring and it helps you with throwing the ball. Yeah, there was even some weirdos that thought they were pros, they had the glove on and everything. When we get down to our lane, we reset the game charter and log in our names. As I'm punching in Lisa's name, I started realizing that she had already picked up one of the bowling balls and was making her way down to the lane. You know that they have those things that hold the pins in place before you start the game. It's like a metal barrier. Yeah, well, she just ran up to the lane and threw the ball directly down it smashing into the metal barrier. It made the loudest noise like something had broken. Most of the people in the bowling alleys went quiet and just stared directly at her. There she stood with bowling shoes on not even laced up, throwing the ball at a metal barrier with tomato ketchup all over her cheeks still. Yeah, this just went from bad to worse and extremely embarrassing. A member of the staff ended up coming down and they gave Lisa a warning. She acted dumb as hell and basically said she didn't understand how to play. They checked the metal barrier and turned out it was only dented slightly. Well, they were going to take a deposit from me because of that, so I guess that's another bad thing about the date. But it's not even done yet either. Eventually, what ended up happening was Lisa ended up taking a shot or a throw, whatever you call it. We were halfway through some of our games and she wasn't that bad. She used that child thing that you push it down as it guides it down. She decided to use a different ball this time and she wanted to roll it herself rather than using the child guider. So, she made a run up and threw it but completely missed the lane and ended up slamming it in between the parting. Yeah, just like that, the ball was now stuck in between two lanes, on barriers. 
Well, without even thinking, Lisa just walks down the lane. She then proceeds to slip and lands on her back and smashes her head on the back of the lane. Then she lets out the most ear-piercing scream and starts crying for 20 minutes straight. Right then and there, I wanted to turn around and just bail. I wanted to bail so bad to avoid the humiliation, but my parents raised me differently. I took the shoes off as they were super slippy, they had polished wooden bottoms. I walked down on my socks and got to her. I tried to help her up at first, but she seemed to be crying and screaming so loud that she didn't care about getting up. Employees turned up and also some medics. They called 911, but there was nothing wrong with her. She was a massive drama queen, and after around 20 minutes of screaming the place down, she ended up walking fine back to my car. She somehow managed to disrupt the entire bowling complex and scare around 50 kids who were trying to enjoy their birthday parties. For the drive back to the parking lot where we met, she was still crying faintly. She was holding her back hips and still had ketchup round her cheeks. At this point, we didn't even say a word. Like, not even a single bit of small talk like we had done on the way there. When we arrived at the parking lot, she undid her belt, walked out and said nothing. She just walked off, and I'm assuming she went back to the bus stop. That's the weirdest first date I've ever had, and I have to say that if you ever use Tinder, even having voice calls and video calls with the girls on Snap still won't teach you what they're like. The weird thing is, she didn't even look like that or have that coloured hair during the voice or video calls, so I'm starting to think if she catfished me or not. After this, she wasn't attractive at all, just because of her behaviour. She had a pretty face and nice eyes, but her hair, her height, and her weight were something she all lied about. And that's what makes this a horror story to me, because of how embarrassed and the fact I spent like 20 or 30 bucks on fuel just to be made to look stupid at Five Guys and a bowling alley. Thanks, Lisa. I've deleted and re-downloaded Tinder around five times. My name's Jamie. I'm 22 years old, female. At the time, I downloaded Tinder just for jokes. Just for funsies. Because me and my friends used to joke about some of the guys on there. We would take screenshots. I think this was back when you could take screenshots of Tinder profiles. It was kind of funny, would have a group chat, basically laughing about some of the guys. I guess it's kind of harsh, but it's how we killed time. Being college students meant that we had a lot of free time, when we weren't revising or working part-time jobs. It's basically what we did. At the time, I wasn't actually serious on the app, but after around a year of pissing around, I decided to give some of the guys a chance. I'd been single for too long now, my last relationship was when I was 16 in high school. I managed to reach out to a couple guys, I gained the confidence to start chatting with them. At first, we only had communications through the app. I wanted to keep it that way till I got to know them better. It kinda sucks that Tinder didn't have voice notes option. I wish they did, and I don't know why they don't. But if you're listening Tinder, you should definitely get those. After a few weeks of talking to a guy called Dave, he ended up agreeing to meet me. We are going to go on a night drive, and try and just chill and get to know each other better. Dave only lived a few miles away from my parents' house, and it turns out he went to the same high school as me, but he was a few years older. He worked part-time in accounts, and he drove this weird Mercedes. I say weird because it didn't look like a Benz or any of the normal ones. I think it was a really old one. He said his granddad bought it for him, which I thought was kind of cute. Dave was an average height, 5'8", 5'9", 
He was quite attractive and had dark curly hair. He agreed to meet me a week later. After this, I ended up talking to him a bit more, just to be sure that I was going to be safe. But I didn't really know what to ask him. I felt like telling him that my friend was coming with us, but I felt like he would bail or get really awkward about it, so I didn't bother. I decided to just go with it and just hope nothing goes wrong, which was one of the worst decisions of my life. Up until this point, Dave had been fine, just like a normal person, but bear in mind I didn't even have his phone number yet. All the talking we had done was through Tinder, I hadn't heard his voice, I hadn't really seen him other than his photos. At this point, he picked me up in the evening and pulled outside my driveway. I walked down the drive. I just wore some jeans and some normal clothes. I think I wore a hoodie with my basketball team's logo on the back. I used to play ball for the high school. The jumper still fit me. I don't know how. I guess I didn't grow past the age of 13, which is kind of funny, lol. Eventually, we got driving. Dave, sure enough, was around average height. He did have long curly hair, just like in his profile, and things were going quite okay. To begin with, he was fairly talkative. He offered me a drink, but I declined. He was driving us to this place that he said he knew about. I didn't really understand, but at first I didn't care. He explained that the place was actually near a harbour, so where there's boats moored up. He said it's peaceful even during the night. On this night as we were driving, I looked up to the sky. I could see stars and the moon was half out. It was quite nice. I found myself relaxing in his company. His tone of voice was nice, peaceful, and he seemed quite confident in my presence, but also laid back. Eventually, we got driving to the harbour. It took around 20 minutes. The traffic was kind of bad, which I don't know why, because it was fairly late. When we arrived, we parked up on the edge of the harbour, near the sidewalk. Dave signalled for me to get out, basically saying that he knew a spot to look over the harbour. I got out the car and shut his door and followed him. We just walked side by side. Eventually we made it to the spot. There was a couple people along the way. I think they were people like husband and wives, or boyfriends and girlfriends. It was the perfect spot. Eventually, we got done with all that. We did some more small talk and chatting, got to know each other a bit better, and then headed back down the steps to his car. The harbour was full of boats, sailing boats, speed boats, all different types. There even looked like some mini yachts off into the distance, just floating around. When we made our way back to the car, I got in the car and said, Okay, this was great, but I gotta get home. Is that alright with you? As if to signal that he had a choice. Yeah, sure, okay, I'll take you back. Just let me know if I get lost, okay? We both giggled. After this, he starts driving back the same way we came. It's only a 15 to 20 minute drive, so it shouldn't be too hard for me to remember. I'd never been near this harbour, but I knew my way from the highway once we got onto it. Sure enough, Dave gets onto the highway. He starts driving, a little faster than usual. I think he was breaking the speed limit, I'm not gonna lie. When we come up to our exit, he doesn't even bother pulling into the left lane, or the right lane, he just stays in the middle one. Yep. The second I realised my doubts were confirmed was when Dave drove straight past our exit off of the highway. I turn to him, confused, and say, uh, that was our exit, Dave. He looks at me and just smiles and says, Oh, my bad. Don't worry, there's another one up here, a few miles down the road. This is when my alarm bells went off and I started to genuinely panic. But I thought it's no big deal. Maybe he did actually just forget. We weren't following a sat-nav or a GPS. And I guess it could be seen as my fault because I didn't give him enough, well, time to react, and he just forgot. Eventually we take the next exit off the highway, and it's somewhere I've never been in my entire life. Turns out it was way longer than 3 miles, it was more like 10 or 15. We've been in the car now for like 45 minutes, and we were driving around on these country lanes. 
I started to get so worried that I asked Dave to get his phone out. My phone for some reason had no signal, not even one bar. I guess we really were in the middle of nowhere. Dave's gone quiet, his body language changes and he just stops talking. I don't know where we were going, but I had the feeling that he did. We kept driving down this country lane. There was the odd street light scattered about the place, maybe every half mile or so. There were big trees, tall aged oak ones on either side. We made our way to the end of a lane, and that's when I realised I was in big trouble. You see, Dave had stopped talking, even when I asked him questions like, Where are we? Are you going to turn round? Where is this going? Dave, what are you doing? He ignored every question, and just looked forward like he was lifeless or being possessed. At this point, we came to the end of the lane and there was a gate. The gate was propped open, allowing enough room for Dave to squeeze the vehicle through. At this point, I knew I was in deep shit. I could see a house and there were lights on inside. It was a country style farmhouse with a couple trucks parked out front. Dave had one of those old Mercedes that don't self lock as you drive. I tried to as quietly and deceivingly as possible undo my seatbelt, but it made too much noise. It got Dave's attention and he turned to me and tried to grab my wrist. I opened the door while he was still driving on the mumpy grass. At this point I dived out the seat, I rolled onto the grass and hit my head. I didn't even care, I could have broke my neck for all I cared. I got up and ran, ignoring the pain. I ran for my life back to the gate, and I heard Dave slam the brakes on. At this point, he got out the car and slammed his door shut, but I remember looking back and he wasn't chasing me. I ran out of the gate and started sprinting down the lane, but I came up with the idea of running into the undergrowth. I threw my body for a bush and ended up finding myself deep in a pitch black woodland. I crouched down for a while and tried to keep as quiet as possible. Around 10 minutes later, Dave's Mercedes and two of the trucks parked out front passed by the lane slower than around 5 miles per hour. They were holding flashlights and shining them all around. I was trying everything I could to hold in my cries of pain as I landed on my head previously. Eventually, once they had gone, I made my way closer to the highway but all the while I was doing this, walking through people's private woodlands, private farmlands, I did anything to stay off that lane. When I made it to the highway, I managed to get two bars of signal. I dialed 911 and they managed to track my location via my phone. This was my worst experience on Tinder to date. Heck, it's my worst experience of my life and I wonder what he planned to do with me in that house.